Mm, let me also see if we have Sebastian. Okay, perfect. So we are uh, we are broadcasted. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can wait. Uh, let me see if the number of participants changes. Uh, I guess we can gradually start. So who is the chairman? Who should? Who should? Uh, yes, we asked yeah, earlier. So who should give an order? Discussion? So let me start. The, the first of all, thank the organizers for, or, for creating this opportunity to meet uh, for us in these difficult times and to exchange nice ideas. And let me also open the today's session with the talk of Alexey Bayarsky about studying the dark matter properties with Lyman Alpha. Let's say you have about 30 minutes. I will give you a warning five minutes prior. Thanks a lot, Oleg. So, uh, dear friends, uh, I want to apologize. I'm now a bit, my brain is a bit busy with very different things. As usual, I have some very nice plots about those things that I'm doing apart from physics these days, which I would be happy to show some of you in private. So I will be, uh, my talk will be a little bit chaotic and improvised and informal. So please uh, excuse me for that. So, but I'll try to discuss with you in this informal matter, something that I find quite important. Uh, so two words of uh, particle physics introduction, why this is so, so important for me. Well, uh, I honestly believe that we, the main goal for particle physics now is to understand uh, how to accommodate to our uh, description of fundamental interactions, three confirmed phenomena that cannot be explained by the standard model, as you know, which are dark matter, baryon asymmetry of the universe and uh, neutrino masses. All other goals, in my opinion, are less critical because they are not based on the experimental evidence. And among this, and of course, to, to, we have so many options how to, to do it uh, and so many directions how to extend the standard model. And in this situation, it would be very good uh, to have some more experimental evidence about these three phenomena, right? Because this would help us to guide ourselves because theoretical biases, when I hear now people talking about one model being more motivated than another model, I take my headphones on and start doing something else because it's just, for me, just a noise. But among these three uh, beyond standard model puzzles, of course, the most promising in terms of having more experimental data is dark matter because dark matter can be studied experimentally, most efficiently. Neutrino oscillations are also, of course, very actively studied experimentally, but this does not tell us the origin of the neutrino masses so, 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 so immediately. And in, in case of dark matter, limiting some properties, is it to what extent it is ballistic or self-interacting? Self How light can it be? boson or fermion, right? Such rough properties of that matter particle, if we believe that is a particle, which I do personally, would give us in invaluable, enormous information for uh, our particle physics work. And we have a hope to get this information because we live in this beautiful epoch of inflow of, of astronomical data. Right now we have Gaia in space, which monitors 10% of stars in the Milky Way, right? So we will have unique information about dynamics of stars. And this information can be used to uh, study the properties of dark 
matter. Very soon we will have Euclid, we hope, which will discover pairs of merging clusters, new quasars, and many, many, many other things that are also useful for that matter. We have James Webb telescope. Uh, we have uh, uh, a little bit later, SKA that is supposed to tell us something more about realization, which as I will discuss is also crucial for the nature of that uh, matter. And we have uh, Daisy <laughs> working and I was expecting for Daisy to start working and uh, I, I thought I knew quite a lot about this your way, but then I was in Morion this January, and I've heard the talk from DASIC, and they said that in one day with good weather, they detected so many galaxies in one day that they were split into 140 thousands of redshift bins. And each redshift bin, as you understand, for DASIC, it's a huge strip on, on the sky, right? So 140,000 redshift beams in one day. So we have really big data, right? Big data is already there and even bigger data is coming. And this gives us a hope to, learn, to constrain much better the possible nature of that matter particle. But can we do it really? Are we able to use all this data? And here I have a little bit of a danger and the main danger, in my opinion, here is the popularity of Bayesian <laughs> approach. So what the, uh, is, if you take a standard paper on the subject, it gives you a formal fit to some data. And then all the physics is hidden in what people call priors. And I hate those, this word because if you hide all the physics into priors, your results become a little bit uh, meaningless. So what I'm, what I want to try to do in this talk is to open a little bit this prior black box for you in one of the <clears throat> methods and explain what are the challenges here and why many results that were published in the literature, in my opinion, have no real physical meaning; they are just formal, and how we can progress in this direction. So this is my goal and I'll, I'll try to do it uh, to, to my best. So uh, yeah, as you know, what we are doing here, we, we are trying to understand whether uh, the vanilla ballistic cold dark matter model is correct or we, we, we need some deviations from it. Uh, the picture from a very nice high resolution simulation published in Nature relatively recently illustrates this fact very well. This is very high resolution dark matter only simulation. So if you take 150 uh, megaparsec box, you see this nice uh, cosmic web and then you zoom in by factor of 10. So to this small circle and you again reproduce this uh, cosmic web and then you zoom into this circle, even uh, another order of magnitude and again and again and again and again and you go down to 25 parsec and you still see a similar structure, right? So this vanilla cold dark matter is supposed to be um, more or less self-similar at all scales. And uh, it means that we need, we should be surrounded by enormous number of small clumps of dark <laughs> matter uh, of smaller and smaller scales of size with large and larger amount. And as you know, the smallest objects, dark matter dominated objects that we observe are, have masses 10 to the nine, 10 to the eight solar, uh, Masses. So most of these wells, or most of this predicted structure is unobserved. And of course, there are two possible reasons for that. One, it, it, it does not exist. And then your dark matter is not cold and you need a reason, some reason. It can be warm and free streaming removes small structure. Maybe it's some kind of self interaction or some kind of fuzziness, any deviation from simple cold dark matter particles should explain for you why the self-similarity stops and small substructures do not exist. Or 
they do exist and we cannot observe them. And it's also very natural because we know that at certain moment, matter, all matter in our universe, as I will discuss in more details later, was reionized. Cold hydrogen that was formed during recombination was reionized by stars. And when you reionize, you also heat because you have photons with different energies coming from stars. They cannot exactly ionize your hydrogen atom and use all its energy to this. They also uh, give some part of, of the energy of photon to the kinetic energy. And suddenly your cold gas that was sitting in these small structures get heated. And then it does not want to be there anymore in small clumps because uh, it, it, it's hot, it wants, it, it wants to go, go out. And it's natural that small halos cannot keep this gas, only the larger ones can do it, right? So this would be another natural uh, explanation why we do not observe all this small substructure, even if it exists. How, we can, how can we check this? There are now at least three methods, very good uh, and uh, promising that can allow us to do this. But I, what I will be discussing is Lyman alpha forest. So as you probably most of you know, the method is quite uh, simple, at least in, in, in theory. You have far away bright source, typically it's quasar, which goes to us through the intergalactic medium. And all this intergalactic medium contains certain amount of neutral hydrogen, even after ionization, some amount of hydrogen remains neutral. And the uh, neutral hydrogen can absorb uh, uh, the light of laser doing Lyman alpha transition. It happens at a given wavelength, which gets redshifted, and then you absorb this. Oh, you absorb this absorption at different wavelengths corresponding to different redshifts, and the depth of these lines is supposed to represent the density of the hydrogen at, at this part of the line of sight. So in this way, you can probe theoretically the density of neutral hydrogen along a uh, line of sight. And uh, having many lines of sight of this kind, you can hope to do a tomography, to build a 3D map of the distribution of neutral hydrogen. And then you hope that neutral hydrogen, because it's cold, neutral, it will follow dark matter to some extent, right? So this would be our naive expectation. And indeed, if you estimate uh, naively the probability of an absorption at a given wavelength, it is given by uh, the uh, local uh, concentration of neutral hydrogen. It depends, of course, also on the cross-section of this Lyman alpha absorption, which is fortunately for us very large, for example, much larger than 21 centimeter absorption. And therefore, even for very tiny fraction of neutral hydrogen at, at low, at relatively low <laughs> redshifts, below six, you still can have significant or even full absorption. And you can study it and theoretically uh, absorbing this F of lambda, you could reproduce uh, tau and N H1. Already here, we have a little bit of a difficulty because the total uh, density of hydrogen is much larger and which fraction of hydrogen is neutral depends on the temperature and other conditions. So, Already here, if you want to relate total density of hydrogen with the density of neutral one, it's quite a non-trivial physics involving temperature density relation and so on. Another difficulty is that this exponential because of course, at the end, what you want to do is not to study individual spectra, which are random and also allow very, very good spectral resolution which is often is not available to resolve these individual features. Instead, you want to study statistics. You want to study power spectrum. And you would like to study the power spectrum of the density distribution. Instead, you study the power spectrum of this exponent of 
uh, optical depths, right? Which makes the problem a little bit more linear and more difficult. And another complication is that you are studying a quantity along line of sight. So you are naturally sensitive not to the three-dimensional power spectrum of matter distribution, but to one-dimensional, which is related uh, uh, to the three-dimensional one in a non-local way. And here I have this little illustration. So if you have this 3D power spectrum with certain cutoff, it's divided by uh, again, uh, with certain cutoff at certain scale, 1D power spectrum has a larger deviation from CDM. And if you change something at small scales in three-dimensional power spectrum, your one-dimensional power spectrum at larger scale will change. So one-dimensional power spectrum observed at larger scales is sensitive to what's going on at smaller scales, which you do not directly observe because of this integral. We should keep this important property in mind. Okay, so far so good. And uh, as, as, uh, as I said, the flagship uh, of these observations are Bose and Daisy that uh, started uh, late in 2021. Uh, these uh, surveys are, are observing hundreds of thousands of quasars. Many of them are suitable for Lyman alpha forest analysis. And so with these instruments, you, you could expect to have so huge statistics that your formal statistical error bars will be very small and you can detect even very small deviation from uh, the cold dark matter power spectrum. And people do this analysis and claim quite strong bounds on uh, uh, mass of the warm dark <coughs> matter or free streaming of dark matter particles, right? Here we should be careful with parameterization. We should not confuse freeze out and freeze in type of warm dark matter because for the same mass, they have very different uh, temperature and uh, average uh, momentum. So, but still quite strong bounds are being uh, Land. And if we very naively build our one-dimensional power spectrum of um, uh, warm dark matter, we see that very strong effect we would have for really very light thermal <laughs> relic below 1 keV, which would correspond to uh, quasi-thermal uh, doddleson vidrow type uh, sterile <laughs> neutrinos with the mass of 3 keV. Uh, so this would give very strong effect already in both. And if you take uh, a sterile <laughs> neutrino with the mass 10 keV, uh, the effect in both and DESI is much smaller and you need to go to smaller scales to, uh, to, to, to have strong uh, effect that it's easily detectable. I should warn you that sterile neutrinos can be produced in many different ways. So they can be, for given mass, they can be colder than this, but this is not important for us right now. So naively from these plots, you can guess what kind of deviations from, war, from cold dark matter you could detect with such a data, like both DAISY and then different telescopes that can go to, to smaller uh, scales. In reality, yes. And indeed, if you look at the data, uh, both and DAISY uh, do not see any visible deviation from cold dark matter. So you could use them to put uh, constraints. While high resolution telescope do see the cutoff, this cutoff is quite strong. It's not a very small effect that requires Bayesian analysis. It's, really something visible by eye, as you see. So we sort of found what we were looking for. Of course, not so easy uh, because there are many other effects that could, uh, that could affect uh, the uh, flux power spectrum of Lyman alpha forest. Here is the same data, but a bit more 
uh, recent version of it and the best fit for the data at different <laughs> redshift. So you see that this cutoff uh, happens at scale smaller than those probed by Boss and Daisy, but uh, still in high resolution data, it is quite well visible by eye. Well, of course, this is the first thing that we should take into account is Doppler, Doppler <laughs> effect. Our hydrogen is supposed to be hot after ionization, as we discussed, so it moves. So uh, it gives you additional uh, uh, red or blue shift or your absorption wavelengths. And instead of being narrow, the lines becomes wider. The lines becomes wider and then, of course, it will remove, it will mask hide structures of uh, very small size. If the hydrogen would be completely cold, you would have a tiny narrow feature in the power spectrum uh, defined by the size of this clump. But in reality, it will look much wider because of the uh, temperature. And indeed, you see that changing the temperature at the given redshift in terms of flux power spectrum looks more or less the same as changing uh, as changing uh, the free streaming of warm dark matter or particles. There is, however, a crucial difference between these two effects. Doppler effect is one dimensional. So you are sensitive only to the velocity along the line of sight. So if you have, for example, a pair of quasars and you are able to see the same structure along two different lines of sights, a little bit in transverse uh, uh, direction, then if the, the apparent width of the line is given by uh, Doppler effect and not by the size of the object, moving a little bit in uh, to the nearby line of sight will, will not show this width, right? So at least theoretically, and we expect that Euclid will find many uh, um, uh, pairs of quasars, you could distinguish Doppler effect from the real width of the lines. And also uh, uh, you, to, to have this Doppler effect very strong, you need quite high temperature, you could discuss what temperatures are realistic, which, are, which temperatures are not realistic. You could try to measure them independently. So it's a difficulty, but you can try to do something about this because this is not a real you know, effect on the distribution of hydrogen. It's sort of observational effect. It's, it's an apparent effect. Unfortunately, this is not the end of the story because there is yet another effect. Uh, there is yet another effect that also uh, plays a role here. And uh, this effect is related to the fact that we are observing distribution of hydrogen and not distribution of dark <laughs> matter. And even provided that the average density of intergalactic medium is low, uh, even neutral <laughs> hydrogen has quite significant probability to collide and therefore quite uh, limited mean free pass. And this mean free pass gives rise to pressure. And pressure, of course, depends on the temperature and density of our hydrogen, which, as I said at the beginning, tells us that uh, you have a characteristic gene scale that tells you what, how big should be a clump to win against a pressure with a given temperature. And this pressure effect affects not apparent properties of the spectra, but real three-dimensional distribution of gas. But the, even this is not the end of the story. The situation even more complicated. And to see that, you simply take this gene's scale and you divide it by speed of sound. And this gives you a time scale which will, which hydrogen will need to, 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 to obey this gene's effect, right? So how fast the hydrogen will depend on the change in temperature and therefore change in pressure. And you see that these numbers are 
very large. It is uh, it is a number that is comparable with the age of the universe. So if you want to see the effect of changing the temperature, you will have to wait and wait very long. So your effect will be delayed and, and accumulated along the whole thermal history of your, hydro, of your high hydrogen gas. And uh, to describe this effect, people introduce a different scale, different from gene scale that is called filtering scale. This is the real scale at which your uh, genes effect will show up at the given redshift, provided that you know how the temperature changed before. And you see that the scale naturally depends on the whole thermal history, how the temperature changed in the past. And to illustrate this, yeah, and what do we know about thermal history? Alexei, well, just to let you know, you are five minutes, roughly five minutes until the end of your talk. So. Okay, I'll try to be fast. Okay. Maybe I will need seven minutes and I hope okay. you will excuse me. Sure. Yeah, so what do we know about thermal history? We know, as we discussed, that hydrogen was uh, very cold. It was cooling with expansion of the universe. And at a certain moment when stars started to shine, it was reionized and heated. So there, there was a moment when the temperature of hydrogen raised significantly and knowing typical ionization, um, ionization energy of hydrogen, we can estimate to what, what temperature it will be heated. This is only an order of magnitude estimate. We cannot calculate this temperature very well. And why? Because it depends on so many different things. First of all, it depends on history of star formation. The, the conditions for formation of stars may depend, they do depend on local environment, local density. What, is, what happens in the neighboring region? Do, uh, if stars have formed already there, right? So if with the same density, if you are affected or not affected by the light of nearby stars that have formed earlier, the star formation in this region will be different. The energy that you have to, to give it to the kinetic energy depends on the slope of the spectrum of photons uh, around uh, the ionization energy. So there are many things that are, can be all together called gastrophysics. There, this is, this, there is nothing fundamental about it. It's very, very complicated physics that involves the interplay between what happens at very small scales where individual star forms and very large scales where uh, much larger structure forms. So if you want to simulate it, these are very, very expensive so-called uh, radiation transfer simulations, which are very far from being definite, right? And the state of the art can be illustrated by, by this plot. So all these lines are possible thermal histories coming from uh, realistic radiative transfer simulations. So the uncertainty in this, in the way how the hydrogen was hit is really huge. And uh, if you assume the simplest possible model that your uh, heating happened instantaneously at certain redshift and you only change this redshift of heating and you see how this uh, uh, scale of suppression by genes effect changes uh, with redshift, you see that the, the heating temperature is the same, only the moment changes, right? So you, you see that, for example, at redshift four, for late reionization, you have very small pressure suppression. And for very early reionization, you have much stronger effect. <laughs> So at what scale pressure will suppress your power spectrum? Very strongly depends on the thermal history. And if we consider two very, or, 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 or three very popular thermal histories, one uh, very late, one very early, and one even earlier, 
you see how uh, how uh, big is the difference in this uh, effect. So if you go back to this picture that I showed, you see that not only the change in the temperature at a given redshift, but also the change in the what you assume about thermal history previous to this pressure will um, uh, easily imitate the effect of warm duck. <laughs> and indeed, if you assume that the thermal history was late, so you didn't have enough time to, uh, to develop a strong uh, suppression, you can already, um, I, I don't see the slides, where is it? I, I lost the slide somehow, but doesn't <coughs> matter. I, I tell you in words, if you assume this late thermal history and you feed the data at, from high resolution telescopes, assuming this thermal history, already now you exclude cold dark matter quite significantly. With this thermal history, that is absolutely possible and realistic, cold dark matter is already excluded and you need warm dark matter to explain data that you have, right? However, with uh, this thermal history, situation is absolutely different. You can do with cold dark matter and you can put quite strong constraints on additional suppression from warm dark matter. And this is illustrated by this picture, right? So here I have flux power spectra, uh, which are uh, done for different thermal histories and different dark matter models. So one is cold, another is quite warm dark matter. And you see that they are indistinguishable at one redshift. So if you want to put any constraints based on one redshift, the only possibility you, you have is to assume that there is no pressure effect and dark matter has to be so warm that it's already warmer than the data. This will be a robust bound, right? Warm dark matter alone without any pressure at all, because we know that there is some pressure there, should not produce more suppression than we observe is in the data. But this gives extremely weak bounds. This robust bound is much, much weaker than those that people Plan. And how in the hell do they produce these strong bounds? And I can tell you, they simply assume certain source thermal history and produce these bounds on top of that, right? This is what is hidden in the priors. And in my opinion, physically, it makes no sense. But can we hope to distinguish between pressure effect and free streaming effect, even theoretically? The answer is yes. Imagine that you have this picture at one large redshift. Assume, uh, for example, redshift six, right? What happens next? In this model, pressure effect will not grow anymore. It is already large, right? Your realization was early and you had enough time to grow the pressure effect by this stretch. In this model, realization was late. The cutoff is mostly explained by warm dark matter, but pressure will still continue to grow. It is small here only because it was late. So you expect that the redshift dependence of these two models will be different. So if you do your analysis, not in one redshift, but you analyze Many redshifts, you might be able to distinguish between these two models that are indistinguishable here. Of course, in the real life is not so easy. And why you can see already from this picture, you have this peak here. Alexei, this yes. sorry, I have One to minute. because we need to leave some yeah. time for questions. Okay, I'm finishing and then you interrupt me. You have this huge, huge, huge peak, right? This is realization of helium. Uh, uh, binding energy of helium is much larger, and therefore the, the temperature where uh, which gas uh, gets during ionization of helium is much larger. So it hides with Doppler broadening. It hides all, all this tiny physics. So 
all your analysis of this redshift dependence has to be done here before realization of helium starts. So between the highest redshifts of the objects that you have and the start of realization of helium. So you have very small actually range. It may be possible, it's very hard. You need a lot of work, uh, both on experimental and theoretical side to do it. And we are not there yet. We are very uh, working on this very, very hard. However, uh, theoretically it's possible, but uh, please do not react uh, on stupid claims in the literature. Uh, yeah, yes. I wanted to add that there are other two powerful methods which can be compared and remove part of uncertainty, uh, strong gravitational lensing and uh, stellar streams, uh, but I have no time to talk about it. So please ask me questions. Yes, so thank you very much, Alexei. Do we upload? Yes, um, first question. Yes. Okay. Yes, so who, who's, who was the first? Yes, Kazuri, Corey, go ahead. You start. I mute yourself. And yes, Misha, you're next. Uh, okay. Hi, hi Alexei. Uh, and this is Kazuri speaking, asking. The, I, I know you assume the completely scale invariant spectral curvature perturbation, right? Uh, uh, down to that small scales. But the, we know the most of the inflation model has uh, no learning or to expect a tilt or something. In that case, the it could be modified at a, at a small scale. So, if the it a little bit blue tilted at this scale, then it can compensate with warm dark matter. I think so. Uh, the excluded region could be you know, shrink a little bit. Don't you think so? Or <laughs> I absolutely yeah. agree with you. Of course, <laughs> if you are free to do whatever you like with initial conditions, you can hide anything. My point right. does not contradict what you say at all. What I say <laughs> is that even if you assume the simplest possible initial conditions and analyze only known physics, which happen later already, in this case, it is extremely difficult to, to do something. What you say makes the life even more difficult, but uh, yeah, but let's, uh, let's uh, postpone it for future, right? Let's, let me understand right. the astrophysics first. Right, but uh, your CDM means the CDM with the scale invariant, right? So, yes, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Conservatively, we may you know, relax this concept or <laughs> assumption. So, yeah, yeah. So, in terms of obtaining the conservative band, we may ch we can change the curvature perturbation at this scale. It's yes. my suggestion. No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Misha? Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, Lucia. Uh, question, maybe you have that in your slides, which you didn't show. Uh, so it's customary uh, what people are uh, showing the pictures and which one axis is mass of, say, sterile neutrino, another axis is uh, the uh, mixing angle. And then there are different lines uh, on this plot which show uh, different limits. And so do you have a plot in which uh, you have most uh, robust limits you believe yes. in? Yes, yes, yes. I can tell you. I personally can exclude only this model, which is 1.9 keV thermal relic. This is enormously weaker than what people claim, but this is the only model I can exclude. And all my work for the last 10 years does not answer me the question how they are able to exclude, exclude anything colder than that by now before solving all these problems that I am just discussing. And uh, 1.9, sorry, if you translate that in uh, Dodelson Vidro, it means what? Oli, can you help me? I, I'm not able to do that in my head. It's just a second, it's not a linear function, so I need to type it in. It's about 10, Misha. Ah, it's about 10. Yes, yes. I see. Okay. 10.3. But it's Dodelson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so it's colder, it's colder it's than, so from this point of view, 7 keV, you cannot exclude in this way. No, no, oh, but 7 keV, it's, re it's resonant, it's a different. Uh, yeah, different yeah. No, no, seven keV you cannot exclude. No, no. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Well, uh, maybe yet another one. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, today, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, today, there was a paper by Julian Lisgur also about all these constraints. I don't know if you have any comments on that. You, no. I didn't see it yet. Yeah, so, yeah, no yeah. Okay, so let's thank Alexei again. Let's say thank you. And we are moving to our second speaker. I assume it will be Alessandro. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, hello, Alessandro. So thank you for the invitation. I will talk about uh, dark matter abundance from thermal decays. In the first half of the talk, the score will be one zero and the second half will be three zero. Let me explain what uh, this means. So if dark matter is made of particles, the cosmological dark matter abundance should come from scattering of dark matter particles. We have no idea, so we do some classification. And uh, to classify, it's useful to use something that is like soccer, soccer notation, which just means count the number of dark matter particles involved in the scattering. So in this notation, 20 is the usual dark matter annihilations because it means two dark matter particles going into zero dark matter particles. So this zero could be any number of standard model particles, two, three, whatever. And people studied also two to one, three to two, four to two. I will not talk about this. So what I will talk about is three to zero, which means three dark matter particles going into any number of standard model particles. And I will start from the simplest possibility, which is one to zero. And I dub this thermal decays because in particular it contains the decay of dark matter particle into any number of standard model particles. It also contains this kind of processes. Dark matter scatters on some, on some standard model particle and this happens at finite temperature. So in the Boltzmann equation, it is described by a finite temperature decay rate. So this motivates the name. This will be the simplest, but it is mostly ignored because there is a big problem, dark matter decays. The typical bound on the dark matter lifetime is much stronger than the age of the universe. Now, whenever dark matter decays into something visible like electron or photon, the bound is 10 to 26 seconds. On the other hand, if these processes are relevant in cosmology, roughly one needs that the temperatures around the mass of dark matter, the abundance, uh, sorry, the thermal decay rate should be comparable to the Hubble rate or bigger. So if you put numbers, there is a huge gap by 30 orders of magnitude between the bound and what we need to do cosmology. So this seems hopeless, but anyhow, let's try. Actually, what I will tell will be relevant in models with the leptoquarks motivated by the flavor anomalies, and will be able to fit the 3.5 Kiwi anomaly, so the one also found by Alexei years ago, and possibly the xenon anomaly. So let's start. First, a brief review of freeze out with the usual annihilations of dark matter. To match the dark matter abundance, one needs a fixed value of the cross-section. Now let's move to one to zero, and this is very much different depending on which side of this reaction is non-relativistic. 
So for example, let's assume that this side is not relativistic uh, as in the usual case. Then their matter has to scatter on some standard model particle. And uh, if this standard model particle is much lighter than their matter itself, this process uh, is much, much, much uh, favored with respect to the usual uh, annihilation. So for example, this is the usual uh, evolution uh, as function of uh, inverse temperature uh, of the dark matter abundance with some value of the cross-section. The usual case of dark matter annihilations is like this. It gets out of thermal equilibrium at some point. If the particle involved in the scattering is lighter, for example, one half of the mass of dark matter, it stays in equilibrium more and more and more if it gets lighter. So freeze out is affected a, loss, a lot, while freeze in is less affected. Um, so before seeing if this can make sense, despite the bound from the dark matter lifetime, let's compute what will be the result. And I will consider a mass with dark matter with mass around the GV, as will be explained later, coupled either via a dimensionless coupling or via a dimension six non-normalizable interaction. So this is the dimensionless coupling. If one does the usual two to zero annihilation, this is the value needed as function of the dark matter mass. Going instead to the one to zero case that we consider, the coupling can be smaller by up to four orders of magnitude. And Frizin in general needs much smaller couplings. Here is the same as function of the non-renormalizable coupling. As usual, the usual freeze out of two to zero needs a coupling, an operator stronger than weak interactions, while this one to zero freeze out will need something weaker than weak interactions. So maybe there is some hope. And of course, if one does freeze in, much smaller couplings are needed. So next, let's see if one can make a model where the bound on the on the dark matter lifetime is satisfied. I take the matter fermion called the key, coupled to a lepton, maybe the muon, and the pion. If the matter is heavier than the sum of pion plus muon mass, in the case at three level into them, it's hopeless. The hope comes if the matter is lighter, because then it's too light, so the only possible decay must have, for example, an off-shell pion. And then the decay rate is suppressed by the width over the mass of the pion, which is about 16 orders of magnitude. This is just a typical weak factor. By the way, this is the reason why I need to go to light dark matter to get this kind of factors. But so I get 16 orders of magnitude by kinematical blocking of dark matter decay. This is not enough because I will need about 30 orders of magnitude. So one hope is to go in this region, make dark matter even lighter then both the muon and the pion have to be off-shell, and the lifetime of the dark matter is suppressed by two off-shell factors, uh, one here and one here. And this will make 30 orders of magnitude. This will be good, but uh, it's wrong. If you compute that one loop, there is also this diagram with just one weak interaction and uh, an electromagnetic loop, uh, and this is too big. Now, in this way, you can get the neutrino. This avoids uh, the kinematical blocking. So this idea fails. Uh, if uh, we were doing engineering, one could be a model with two such particles, maybe called them generations. And this could work, but uh, I prefer to do physics. So I will not discuss this part. And instead, let me try to do even nice physics. 
uh, even if Alex A does not like the word. So uh, I assume that the matter is a right-handed neutrino and I need the interactions for it. And the nicest way to get interactions is extend the standard model gauge group. For example, if one adds right-handed SU2, the right-handed W couples the right-handed neutrino to the right-handed lepton, and it also couples the right-handed quarks. This will make a pion. I will get the matter muon pion. The same happens if the standard model is extended, adding patisalam SU4. Here there is some particle called the leptoquark because it couples two leptons at two quarks. So it couples the matter to right handed quark, and it also couples right handed leptons to quarks. And this at the end will give exactly the same coupling, dark matter, lepton pion. This particle is the one that people like to fit the flavor anomalies. In both cases, at the end, one gets an effective operator involving dark matter, a lepton, and two quarks. This could be right handed or left handed, depending on the model. Then one can convert the quarks to pions. And one can immediately see that the left-handed case is no good because the neutrino is involved at three level and then it's hopeless. You have the bad unsuppressed decay at three level. So we consider the right-handed case. The danger was the loop decay. Here I estimate the loop is dominated at scales around the QCD scale. And the result, again, is that uh, it's a problem. So this is the dark matter mass and this is the dark matter lifetime. Here I assume a coupling C around the weak scale just to, to fix the normalization. The three level decay can be very, 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 very slow. So it's not a problem. Why the loop decay is too fast. It depends a bit on the flavor, but anyhow, it's a problem. So anyhow, we compute this hopeless theory and we find that it's hopeless. To reproduce the dark matter abundance via thermal freeze out, one needs to be along this line. And this is excluded twice. First, it's excluded by loop decays. They exclude all this red region. Furthermore, it's also excluded by Collider bounds uh, computed in effective field theory approximation. Now we have a normal normalizable interaction, it gets bigger uh, at bigger energies, uh, so there are bounds. So at the end, uh, what can be done uh, is freezing. It's allowed, uh, it's dominated not in the effective uh, theory with operators, but around the mass of the mediator. That could be the leptoquark of. Uh, Favor anomalies, or maybe a right handed W. In any case, this is the prediction for the dark matter abundance. And from this expression, one can see that the needed dark matter abundance is reproduced if the coupling of, for example, the leptoquark to the matter is around 10 to minus 11, very small. Actually, this is so small that it sounds bad. But people who do flavor models consider this kind of theories. They add patisalam, but only for the third generation. And then the lighter generation acquire couplings to this patisalam suppressed by small factors like frogal nielsen factors. So this is the usual models that people use to explain the small Yukawa couplings. And the same smallness of Yukawa couplings comes in this coupling to their matter. So at the end, okay, taking into account that all this field is not precise, more or less this can be done. What are the signals? The signals will be very different from the usual signals of their matter because now we have one their matter that scatters on standard model, one instead of two. 
So one possibility is a, a dark matter interaction. Uh, now here, now I consider nucleons rather than pions because uh, now we do experiments with nucleons. So there are a, a possible coupling to neutron and a possible coupling uh, to proton. At the end, this will mean that the dark matter hits a nucleus and the dark matter becomes a neutrino and the nucleus gets some recoil. This is like the usual normal signal because nobody can see that the neutrino is different from the dark matter. So what is more interesting instead is the analogous of charged currents where dark matter couples to lepton, charged, neutron and proton. Then what would happen is that dark matter scatters on a nucleus and what comes out is a recoil nucleus, but now also a charged lepton. That will be roughly monochromatic. So this will be perfect to fit the xenon anomaly that claims, if you trust that this is an anomaly, claims a peak in the recoil energy spectrum of the electron. This possible interpretation of the anomaly is allowed by bounds on decay. It's excluded by not much by collider bounds that probably we have overestimated because we did the effective field theory while this laptop work will be in the T channel. So some factor of two will be less. Another signal is fitting the 3.5 keV anomaly, uh, of course, uh, using the bad loop decay of uh, the dark matter that now becomes a signal. Uh, maybe, okay, uh, what is interesting is that this model allows to fit the, anom the anomaly compatibly with the getting the dark matter abundance via Frizin. Uh, this is non trivial because uh, if you have the usual model, uh, where freezing happens via neutrino oscillations, numbers don't match. So people add extra mediators to do, to get the right dark matter abundance. And here the extra mediators are the left course motivated by the flavor anomalies. Okay, so I switch to the second half of the talk where I will be motivated by the neutral decay anomaly. So to start, let me review what it is. The neutron lifetime is measured with two different techniques that consistently give different results. One is the so-called bottle method. They store neutrons in some place and count how many they remain after some time. And this gives the total neutron decay width. The other method is called BIM. Basically, they measure the beta decay rate by looking at the standard model particles. And the two results are different at about 4.6 sigma. So this is the historical series of measurements. The bottle method seems trustable. The B method may be Maybe the problem is just that these experiments uh, are bad. Now we will see in the future if this anomaly will be confirmed. For the moment, uh, I try, I trust it and try to see if this can be fitted. And uh, many other authors tried. Uh, what they considered is a dark matter key coupled to up, down, down quark. So that when uh, you go from quark to nucleon, this becomes a mass mixing between dark matter and neutron. And then neutron decays into dark matter photon. And the dark matter has to be a little bit lighter than the neutron. This is excluded twice. First, it's excluded if, uh, if uh, dark matter is light enough that it does not decay. So now to be dark matter, it cannot decay. Then it must be light. And then this photon has too much energy and it's excluded by experiments that look for this photon. Second, it's excluded 
by neutron stars. Uh, here, the reason is that to fit the anomaly, I need the uh, extra decay rate of this order of magnitude, uh, second minute, something like this. Uh, while a neutron star exists since a million of years. So if this process is present, the matter will thermalize inside the neutron star. Then the equation of state of neutron star will be softened. And at the end, the mass of a neutron star will be smaller than the solar mass. More or less, dark matter will behave like a free neutron. So what applies is the Oppenheimer computation done a century ago. While today we know that neutron star exists with mass of two solar masses. So people try to save this model. Let's make their matter interacting, but the bullet a lot of problems. So let me try something different. I have to do some crazy dark matter that interacts a lot with standard model particles like the neutron. So first, to avoid big troubles, I have to conserve a baryon electron number. And then uh, he, the table lists the possible baryon and lepton number of dark matter, such that uh, these quantum numbers are conserved. So, for example, if baryon number is one and lepton number is zero, the matter needs to have spin one half. And this is the model we just discussed that uh, does not work. If the matter has baryon number zero, and lepton number one, it's the right handed neutrino discussed in the first half of the talk. What I discuss now is the only line of this table that works, and it's this one. Dark matter with baryon number one third, like works. So maybe it's not crazy. This will mean that the neutron decays into three dark matter particles. And then I get the three to zero process. So let me go brief. Why this is good to avoid troubles with neutron star? Everything is in this equation that looks trivial, but I suffered a lot to get it. It tells the chemical potential of their matter in thermal equilibrium in a neutron star with neutrons have their, their chemical potential. And this B is the baryon number of their matter. So in the previous case where one neutron becomes one their matter, they have the same chemical number. In this model, their matter has one third of the chemical number of the neutron. And uh, since the abundance goes as the cube, uh, it means a lot of less dark matter inside uh, the neutron star. This is why this model uh, gains a lot and could be good. Uh, it also gains on some detail. So to compute, uh, let's first discuss the mass of dark matter. It needs to be tuned. Uh, this must be open, so the matter must be lighter than one third of the neutron, but not by much. Otherwise, one has troubles with nuclei decaying into the matter or proton stability or so on. So at the end, there is a range allowed that is this one, three, one, three, three, one, two. So it's a tuned model. And in half of this, parameter space, uh, hydrogen can decay into dark matter. Uh, neutron star. So, uh, okay, one has to study a lot, but let me skip the details. Let me just show the final result. This is the equation of state of uh, density pressure in the standard model. How it's modified by the model that fails. Neutrino goes into one dark matter. It's modified a lot. In my model, it's modified by less. So when I put the equation of state into the Tolvol Oppenheimer V, I forgot who is V, to compute the neutron star mass, the standard model predicts this. So it can make a neutron star with two solar mass. The other model cannot. This model 
is almost as good as the standard model. So this is allowed. I don't need to now to add any interaction of their matter with itself. It works by itself. It works so well that I could put the two generation of their matter and it will still be allowed. So let's do a little bit of theory. Their matter must be a Dirac fermion so that the baryon number is conserved and it must couple three dark matter to one neutron. So for the first time in your life, you see a charge conjugation in an operator. Usually you can get rid of all of charge conjugation. Here you cannot. The only way to write this operator is with charge conjugation. Then you can compute, for example, this decay. This is what should fix the anomaly. And the result is that the anomaly can be fitted if the scale that suppresses the operator is around 100 TV or maybe 30 TV because there is some extra little suppression due to Pauli antisymmetry that suppresses the matrix element. So if there is just one dark matter, I need the 30 TV. If there is two dark matter generation, it can be 100. Alessandro, you, you have five minutes left. So. Okay, I, I will be faster. Okay. Next, uh, one can check uh, if uh, other processes uh, are allowed. For example, uh, the other model was excluded by the decay into a photon. Here, to get a photon, I need to pay a big price, nine orders of magnitude, and then it's allowed. Or uh, hydrogen decay, you know, it's this Feynman diagram where the neutron becomes a proton, it's allowed. Also because uh, here there is a neutrino, so nobody will see this decay. Hydrogen decay, visible, as previously adding a photon, I add again an extra suppression to pay for the photon, and then the bound is stronger, but this is compatible with the bound. Uh, theory. Okay, I have five minutes, so I will skip the ugly theory. Uh, the theory will be a dimension nine operator between the dark matter and quarks. It, it's not nice, but can be done. Let's go to cosmological dark matter abundance. D3 to zero interaction that I need to fit the neutron decay anomaly is weaker than weak. The suppression was many 100 TV. So this means freeze out impossible, asymmetry impossible. The only thing that work, the could work is freeze in from neutron decay. And the result is too small by four orders of magnitude. However, the neutron decay was suppressed by the little phase space and similar process don't have this suppression. So uh, I can have thermal scatterings uh, where uh, I add a pion here or a photon. I can have uh, particles similar to the neutron, but heavier that exist in the standard model that behave like the neutron, but without uh, the non-relativistic suppression because they are heavier. And I have this kind of processes that uh, also enhance uh, with our matter abundance. So at the end, the result is that uh, it seems possible to match the dark matter abundance uh, from interactions with the neutron. It's better not uh, to go to full models with mediators because then uh, one gets too much dark matter. Uh, to conclude, uh, signals. Uh, so one signal of very specific to this model is uh, anti dark matter, scattering of neutron, giving two dark matter. The cross-section can be computed and it's small enough to be compatible with bounds on dark matter direct detection. But actually, this process gives a lot of energy, about one third, two thirds of GV. So the best experiments are not those that uh, search for just a nuclear recoil, 
but are experiments that look for a much bigger energy than the recoil, in particular experiments that search for a proton decay. And uh, you know, one has to speak in their language. You know, uh, in their language, this process will be an effective lifetime of the neutron. A neutron hit by their matter does something. So this is the conversion between cross-section and lifetime. This value means roughly 10 to 29 years. And uh, the signal will be like this. Uh, there is a, a nucleus, uh, for example, oxygen in, in the water of super -caniocande. It's hit by an anti the, nu the, the neutron inside disappears and two dark matter go out. They are not detected. What remains is a nucleon excited because one new neutron is missing that decays, emitting a specific photon and doing some specific decay. And at the end, uh, the bounds are uh, 26 to uh, are comparable to the signal. So this is uh, um, the predicted signal is comparable to the bound. And then uh, there are order one factors inside the model. Uh, I don't have super caniocande here because super caniocande is bigger and only looked for higher energies. So I can get a higher energy by adding a photon to what I did before. Then I have to pay three orders of magnitude. And again, this, uh, what I get is compatible with the experimental bound. Conclusions, uh, the dark matter cosmological abundance can be produced by one to zero as freeze out, but models are not nice. One to zero as freeze in, in models that are nice and can fit the various anomalies. And furthermore, three to zero is a model that can fit the neutron decay anomaly. So if one of these anomalies will be true, maybe what I said can be relevant. Okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Okay, so, oops. Uh, questions? Yes, Valeri, go ahead. Sandra, uh, if you drop the requirement that you want to explain Newton decay anomaly, uh, what could be the range of the masses of your uh, three to zero uh, dark matter particles? What are the, what, I mean, how, how wide is the uh, parameter space? I have not tried that. Uh, you know, I started uh, to, to do the anomaly. I have just done this. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't know. Maybe it's interesting to study, but I have not done. Uh, uh, some other people did uh, something they call Z3 dark matter uh, that is somehow like this, but it's different. Uh, okay. Misha? Yeah, you're muted. Yeah, uh, hi, Alessandro. Uh, yeah. Just a question that, to make sure that I understand. Uh, uh, in page 20, you mentioned that uh, ordinary neutrino oscillations cannot produce uh, cell neutrino dark matter. So you had in mind that the situation in which uh, uh, there are no lepton asymmetries, or you had in mind something else? Uh, yes, uh, no, if you have a huge, huge, huge lepton asymmetry, much bigger than the baryon asymmetry, then uh, it's different. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, I uh, just wanted to make sure. Yes, yes. Uh, and this is what you, know, you did. Uh, uh, other questions? Valeria, your hand is raised, but that's the previous one, right? Sorry, I forgot to. It's okay. Um, yes. Uh, yes, I also have a question. So, in principle, uh, by observing a uh, neutron star mass distribution, can we tell something about dark matter? Or in this model, there will be no way? So, I uh, tend 
to be pessimistic. So the model is so good that the difference with respect to the standard model is little. And the standard model itself is uncertain because you know, the equation of state of neutron is not really known. You know, some people tell maybe hyperions change a lot. So I believe at the moment is within the uncertainties of the standard model prediction. I see, I see, thank you. Yes, Alexei, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, Alessandro. It's just, uh, uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning flavor anomalies. And at the end, I think in your conclusion, they were not emphasized. Did I mm -hmm. miss anything or? Uh, what are you asking about the rumors? Eh? Well, I, I'm not asking about the rumors. Of course, I know the rumors. And this is one of the reasons of my questions. But I'm asking why, 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 in the frame of your talk, why you mentioned flavor anomalies at the beginning and not in the conclusion. Is it because of the rumors or because of some other reason? Uh, it's because uh, we had uh, to fight with collaborators to choose a title. Now, we, the title could, could have been uh, uh, three lines long. Eh? And they I wanted see. the flavor anomalies. I wanted their matter. So at okay. the end, this okay. is my talk. I put their matter. Okay. okay. And also, I, I, I also know the rumors. Okay, good. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm here. Shall I turn off uh, YouTube streaming so we, we all can know the rumors? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I remember still being streamed on YouTube, so I should be careful with. Yeah, right now we're streamed on YouTube, but if you want, I can turn this no, on. No, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> we oh. will keep secret with Alessandro. That's more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, any other questions? I don't see any, so let's thank Alessandro again. Thank you. Alessandro, thank you. Yes, so our next speaker is Kosnori Kori, speaking about primordial black holes and their observational constraints. Uh, okay. Can you see my castle? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Shall you start? Well, a little bit, to, it, it, a little bit to area, right? <laughs> the, the... No, uh, yeah, we have two minutes. <laughs> okay. Today, okay, I I will give a give a talk uh, talk about primary black holes and the observational constraints. Asked by organizers, I'm Kazukori from KEK. Okay, so actually we have a strong motivation to consider to study primary black holes because at least uh, Lig and Vago detected the the very massive binary black holes, say. 30 solar mass, but in astrophysics, there are no good model to produce 30 solar mass or larger. So, and it's very beautiful that the, once we assume homogeneously distributed primary black holes pro produced by the capture perturbation in the early universe, then only by three body effect, not the two body collision, only by three body effect of the object, the, it's naturally we can fit to the event late, say GW, that of the GW 15 or 9, uh, 14, uh, by assuming the number density or energy density, uh, it's a fraction to CDM to be just 10 to minus three, not the 100% or 100% to CDM, just only assuming the, the order of 10 to minus three, then, um, Beautifully, the event rate can be fitted automatically. So that is a very attractive point and a very strong motivation, motivation, motivation to study primordial black hole. Okay, and uh, yeah, yeah, this is my uh, that our master figure of the constraint on primordial black holes. Uh, some of them are uh, derived by my collaborations and. Uh, the x-axis is the mass of PBH from the black hole in, in gram. And okay, and the upper horizontal axis gives the mass in solar mass. And the, the y-axis is 
the fraction, energy fraction to the CDM. So unity means 100% of CDM. So yeah, I have been engaged in for a long time, but constraint from gamma rays, say the, the isotropic gamma ray background. So evaporating, Hawking, through the evaporation through the Hawking process, the uh, PBH can emit gamma rays. And by conservatively, we can constrain by comparing the isotropic gamma ray background, diffuse, diffuse gamma background. And the okay, mass is 10 to 7, 17, 10 to 70 gram. The accidental is the same number of 10 to minus 17 and solar mass. The conservative we can ex exclude this PBH. So in other words, the PBH can be dark matter from here, 10 to minus 17 gram to 10 to 23, uh, 23rd gram. Yeah, here, it's a, here is allowed to be dark matter. So it's very attractive. And uh, next I will discuss any uh, variety of constraints. Here is the lensing, lensing constraint. And here is gravitation wave detection or non-detection non or detection. I discussed in previous uh, slide that the, here it, it, the PBH can be, can fit to the LIGO bargo event partially, the not the whole, whole event. And here the accretion onto PBH emits emits photons, and it can affect the CMB temperature fluctuation and polarization and uh, no detection of big EE mode, then we can exclude this region. And here, the gray region completely excludes the PBH, which are produced by curvature perturbation because of the mu distortion. If curvature perturbation is big, then the dissipation of photon or curvature perturbation can induce the uh, mu distortion of the Planck distribution of CMB. So this gray region is completely excluded. So yeah, so white, the only white region could be you know, allowed by observation. This is my master figure. And the, the so far we have strong motivation to consider the, the satis solar mass black, prime the black hole for gravitational event. And here we, uh, dark matter, PBH can be dark matter, say mass is 10 to 17 grams. And here, the, you, some of you, uh, you know that the PBH can be a seed of supermassive black hole after Eddington accretion, super Eddington or Eddington accretion. So mass would be 10 to four or 10 to five solar mass. And abundance could be smaller than the, the dark matter density, but that it's sufficient. And another uh, super team or another group reported that the some uh, hero could be observed uh, around here. The mass is 10 to minus five solar mass or something. So it's the overall event, optical galactic lensing event. So this might be also a prime on the black hole. Okay, then, yeah. But the, it's very interesting that the, in future, by using the planned the gravitation wave detector such as DESIGO or ET or Cosmic Explorer, we can look the, observe the, the binary event, major event up to redshift to more than 15, say 20 or 30 by Cosmic Explorer or DESIGO or BBO. Then we can, in principle, discriminate the event from the astrophysical binary black holes because it has a sharp dependence as a function of redshift because it was the astrophysical black hole merger is produced by, say, the death of pop three stars or death of massive pop two stars or something. So it has a clear uh, feature here. But uh, the prime black hole event uh, approximately constant from the early universe. So if we observe the event, gravitational event, up to red shift more than 15, then in principle, we could discriminate even. So uh, yeah, in future, we can detect the black, black, black holes, prime black holes by gravitational wave detection. Okay, 
So yeah, next, I briefly explain the formation mechanism of primary black holes in the early universe, both in radiation domination and the early, early matter dominated universe. It's completely different. They are completely different from each other. So, so historically, the, this uh, mechanism produced in radiation domination has been studied for a long time. And it's very simple. The, everything is spherical in radiation domination. So the point is that the gravity could you know, overcome the pressure, radiation pressure, uh, effective in the fluid of uh, cosmology, uh, fluid mind equation. So simply, you know, of course, we have deep understanding of this one, but that simply, intuitively, we can understand that the pressure gradient could be you know, smaller than the gravity. So pressure over energy density should be larger. Hmm? Uh, yeah, <laughs> larger. So uh, in this case, we may assume uh, require that density perturbation is larger than this critical density pressure over density, energy density. You know, this is the sound speed, all of the sound speed square or the cos cosmological equation of state parameter W. And we know the order of one third, or according to my computation in detail in GL, it would be the point four or something. Then the this region locally could collapse into a black hole due to the nature of the closed universe. So it locally it looks like closed universe, and with the the wave number k. For the horizon crossing K, uh, wave number K is parameterized one to one correspondence with the Hubble parameter at that time. And if this region completely has the, the density perturbation or covered density perturbation delta, which is larger than one third, then the, it can collapse into black hole. This is an intuitive understanding of the formation mechanism of prime and black hole in the early unit. Next, I will discuss the formation in matter domination. So please wait for a while. And uh, yeah, and by considering only for the formation in radiation domination, the, uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with the curvature perturbation and the, the abundance, it's abundance. In this community, historically, people have studied the beta parameter. Beta is the definition of the energy density of PBH to the total energy density namely the radiation density at the formation, not the current, this is the formation. So this would be the omega parameter in the early universe, not the current omega parameter. Then, yeah, the, if the, we assume the Gaussian static C holds for the density perturbation up at around order one, then we can, we can just integrate from the threshold value to unity or infinity, it's a definition of the fraction collapsed into PVH. So if we adapt the threshold value to one side simply, or according to our uh, detailed computation, it would be similarly 0.4 or 0.5. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, if you can choose your favorite threshold, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with the abundance of PVH to the curvature perturbation small scale, not the large scale. That is very important point. And this one gives the error function of the threshold of density perturbation. And uh, by expanding this one in, extend, expanding this one as an asymptotic expansion, the, there is, you see this expression analytically. The, so beta parameter has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the curvature perturbation, P zeta, which is sleeping in the shoulder of the exponential, the denominator of this exponential, the arguments. And uh, this beta is also has a one-to-one -one correspondence to the omega parameter at present. So you know, to be a dark matter, this, this combination omega h square is uh, point, point 0.12 or something. So uh, yeah, you can you can have the one-to-one -one correspondence with curvature perturbation and the, okay, the mass of PVH. If you assume 100% of the dark matter is composed of primary black holes. So see, if primary black hole mass is 10 to 15 gram, then the, uh, the this fraction to collapse into PBH is just 10 to minus 18. 
So this is a very rare event. It's the outskirt of the, or the, the tail, tail part of the Gaussian distribution. So it is very small, but it can contribute to dark matter 100%. This is a very interesting point. Okay. And uh, I said there is a one to one correspondence with this fraction to the CDM F parameter. So the definition is omega PB to the omega CDM at present has a one to one correspondence with curvature perturbation, which is living in the exponential, the denominator of the exponent. exponent. So small change of curvature perturbation gives a big change in fraction. So uh, actually we need 10 to the minus, order of 10 to the minus two of curvature perturbation, two point coordination of curvature perturbation gives the 100% of dark matter. Yeah, and for 10 to 15 gram, the beta is 10, order of 10 to the minus 18, and for one solar, 10, 30 solar mass, uh, beta is order of 10 to the minus eight to, to obtain 100% of CDM. Okay, next, the, okay. Yeah, yeah because the, the people have considered the formation in radiation dominated universe collapse, everything is spherical. And because the pressure is dominated, radiation pressure dominated and the balancing pressure and the gravity. So everything is spherical. So uh, the very strong prediction is that the angular momentum produced PVH is negligible. So according to our very precise computation, the, the so-called dimensionless car parameter A is the order of 10 to minus three or something. Of course, which depends on the mass of PVH. Here we call it the horizon mass. Yeah, so yeah, sorry, I didn't introduce the horizon mass. The mass is completely the you know and the computed by the horizon energy. In astronomy, you call in cosmology, observational cosmology, people call the horizon mass, but the, correctly it's the horizon energy in radiation domination. The completely the law included by Hubble horizon is you know can be a mass of PVH. So to produce such solar mass, the formation is before the BBN after or after QCD phase transfer 40 MeV to produce 10 to 7, 15 grams, the temperature was three times 10 to 8 GeV. So yeah. So and the lifetime is you know calculated by Hawking process. And so 10 to 15 gram has uh, the cosmic age, current cosmic age. So this one is evaporating now. And you know Hawking temperature. So if, 10 to 15 gram corresponding to the whole temperature of 10 MeV. So the future MeV observation, gamma ray observation can constrain this the 10 to 15 gram. Okay, and right. <laughs> and so the Rai and Berg and Kagura reported that the effective car parameter or the spin is complete zero consistent. It's consistent with zero. So so far, we, so far, the big error bar for the spin after mergers uh, cannot discriminate it. So still, the PBH scenario formed in radiation domination is, co is consistent with each other. Yeah, this might be a strong evidence or a very optimistic result to verify the PBH formed in radiation domination. Okay. And uh, yeah, for models, maybe this afternoon, maybe some of people discuss the model of BB formation, but the, uh, we, we have a long history to you know, construct the inflation model to produce from, from, the, from the black hole. And please note that this history existed just even before the ultra slow inflation becomes popular, become became popular. It's very important point that because new people, newly or young people thought that the PVH can be produced only in the ultra slow or inflation something. It's wrong, completely wrong. That I'd like to say this message to the, to the community that the <laughs> we don't need it's not necessarily we don't need the uh ultra slow. -low. So <laughs> the it's uh, it's a wrong message or wrong understanding. So, for example, the okay, this time I may introduce the in, 
the blue tilt spectrum, it can reach the order one of coverage perturbation at small scale than without imposing any filter or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, simply if if we consider this kind of hilltop inflation model and uh, it ends at ends at the, the waterfall mechanism or something. So epsilon parameter, that means fast derivative of potential becomes smaller and smaller towards the end of inflation, like a hybrid inflation. In that case, the automatically the coverage of attention can be enhanced. Enhanced. It, sometimes it, this, this gives ultra slow, but it, we don't need we, we necessarily we don't need the, the ultra slow phase, just a simple slow calculation. Then at the end of towards the end of inflation, coverage of perturbation can be smaller, the larger towards the small scale. So it that's it. So even in the supergravity, uh, this is the A term, A term can give this kind of negative higher order term. And so here top structure may be produced, then yeah, it's good. So even in this simple model, we can produce from the black holes. And the, the, the important point is that the, the, if we have the large learning and large learning or learning, positive learning or learning, then it, that, that's sufficient. The, it, from the plan to 2015 or 2018, the sizable the learning and learning learning are still allowed, the order of 10 to minus two, C 0.02 or 0.01 or something, then the at small scale, then it can reach it to order order 10 to minus two or something of coverage of perturbation. Say uh, K parameter K wave number would be 10 to 5 megapascal inverse or something. Then it can produce the 30 solar mass of PVH to fit to the to the live or bug or color event. So it's good. So People are now nowadays. People are very, very interested in the, the ultra solar phase. It is you know, steeply reproduced here by the K2 force or something. Yeah, it's good, but without considering uh, requiring ultra low solar phase, the, even if the learning or learning is big, say 0.02, then, then it can lead to order 10 to minus 2 at small scale. So, yeah, yeah, it's a very misleading point. So. Sometimes we need ultra solar, but the, the, in some models we don't need ultra solar. That is very important point. Okay, next. The okay, yeah. Today I may int introduce you the 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 various observational bounds, but the, uh, the time is limited, so I just show you the results of the constraints. Yeah, because originally organizers asked me to introduce this observational bound on P. Yeah, so from the, okay, gamma ray observation, uh, you see the, the 10 to 15 gram or 10 to 10 to 17 gram PVH is are now gradually evaporating due to Hawking process. And the temperature is order of MEB, say the, and, but the unfortunate is for MEB gamma rays are not, have not been constrained by observation. So it's a, very loose, only loosely constrained, say by Comptel or Hiao or something, Apollo or something. But here we adapt, uh, we have adapted the Comptel data of, for the isotropic diffuse gamma rays, not the gamma ray towards the galactic center because it has been you know, cont contaminated at many astrophysical origins. So conservatively, we have adapted the bound from the diffuse gamma ray, isotopic diffuse gamma ray observed by Compton, and the error bar is so big. So it is very cons conservative, but still it's effective. So for 10 to 15 gram, the PVH is gradually evaporating and it emits the approximately Planck distribution plus some correction, so-called gray body factor. And this, this, this point, Bound the abundance of PVH with mass of 10 to 15, 17 grams. This gives the dark matter density. And in future, some future maybe gamma ray project may constrain more, say SMILE or, yeah, <laughs> many, many projects are planned now. 
And at the smaller mass, say 10 to 15 grams, the CTA will constrain more in the near future. Okay. And for lensing, so the Subaru team uh, observed the, the lensing event toward M31 and Meda, and uh, but someone improved the analysis by uh, by 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 changing the the and the yeah light light uh, brightness of the star so stars or something then the nowadays the band becomes a little bit milder than the barrier of observed reported by the bad team originally yeah, here so around here the 10 to 23 gram pbh is constrained by this lensing event and uh, yeah, okay. And the Ogre event, the it's a optical galactic lensing event. The the so far the and by the old analysis of all the data, they exclude those regions. Or sometimes, but according to their analysis, uh, allowed region to be also existed here. So yeah, it's interesting that so this is excluded region, but. Uh, some point the, around here, say 10 to minus, hmm? oh, this will be not good. Yeah, 10 to minus five. So I'm, I'm here, the allowed region is open, but uh, it uh, depends on the systematics. Okay. <clears throat> and for the, and the bound from accretion disks. So it, this has also a long history, but the quite recently, my, my collaboration pointed out that the actually PBH look like CDM, but the the it has a relative velocity with the with variance. So such a the velocity difference gives the angular moment, relative angular moment between PBH and the variance. So inevitably accretion is through the disk life. The according to our analysis, it's a, a combination of Ada, so called the layer plus standard disk type shape. And so inevitably, it does, it, it is disk like, not the spherical accretion. So, yeah, so and in this case, bound becomes stronger inevitably. The emission from the, the, the disk, it's a radio, it can affect the, the CMBT template temperature or mode polarization. And can be modified, but so far we haven't observed such kind of big EE mode or something. So we can constrain the number density of the primary black holes. And in addition, the quite recently, the such a PBH is, is should be dressed by another CDM component, say Axion or WIMP. The, the profile is R2.25, analytically or numerically derived. So this is also inevitable effect onto PBH. So we have to consider this halo and the PBH inevitably uh, to consider the accretion. So it can gather more baryon, dissipation, dissipated baryons and emit photons. So, and uh, I said such a photon affects the, the reionization history. So luminosity becomes higher than the spherical case and the, the ionized fraction where electron hydrogen is modified by such emission, spherical-like accretion or disk-like accretion. The disk-like accretion is stronger in this case because temperature is larger and luminosity is larger. And the, yeah, so TT correlation it doesn't affect, is not affected so much, but for EE, EE polarization, the disk, it can it may discriminate this like accretion or spherical accretion or something. So like this. So and so far we haven't observed this EE deviation, deviation with EE mode. So we can exclude the such a uh, uh, prime, prime and the black holes. So this one we go to, just to let you know you yes. have five minutes. Okay to Sati, uh, sat in total sati minutes, right? So yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So yeah, here the this is allowed region to fit the LIGO Vago data, say with the sati solar mass. But the by considering the accretions onto 
the dress to PBH, it inevitably happens that, that this region is completely excluded due to the non-detection of EE mode. So someone may believe only the spherical acquisition or no, no, without the dark matter halo, but the inevitably, inevitably PBH is dressed by the CDM. This is not the 100% CDM. So that we need another component of CDM stay axion or WIMP or something, then yeah, bound becomes stronger. This is conservative, but uh, inevitably happens. So it's a very important point. So yeah, here it's completely excluded, but the allowed region is here. And another interesting bound is mu distortion. As already said that the, to produce PVH, we need large curvature perturbation, but in, Large curvature perturbation can dissipate through C, the silicon damping or something, then it can heat the, the CMB Planck distribution. Then the Planck distribution uh, may have effective chemical potential, but uh, we haven't observed the chemical potential in CMB Planck distribution. So this region is completely excluded. So, yeah, this is very strong. So, so it can exclude the parameter regions of PVH less than to, to be less than 10 to 4 solar mass. Yeah. So, and today I only uh, stress the detection of PVH by gravitation wave, but the someone have uh, exclude, uh, deposed the exclude region if it has not been de detected or not. So, yeah. If we assume that the non-detection of PBH through the LIGO bargo, then this region is completely excluded. But if they add the information to be detected here, then this region becomes milder. So we may believe this one to be an excluded region by the LIGO and bargo. Yeah. So I this is a master figure. Already I told you the, the very yeah, yeah, introduce. So only white region could be allowed. Yeah. And the very severe point is that the, to evade the mu distortion, the, yeah, we, we, we only have the upper bound on the mass of PBH to be 10 to four or 10 to 3.5 solar mass. Yeah, this is very important point. Yeah, and the next I will discuss the secondary gravitational wave produced by large curvature perturbation. Inevitably, this happens. Uh, yeah, okay. The secondary gravitation waves. Yeah, this has also a long history. The, if the curvature perturbation you have is large, okay, Sorry. within 10, 30 minutes, <laughs> and we have a 10 minutes discussion, right? So, yeah. And if we have large curvature perturbation, then through the bilinear effect or Nonlinear effect, the gravitation wave, namely tensor perturbation, can be produced. So this is a very important point. So normally, uh, normally, the, if we assume CMBs, the power, you know, scale invariant perturbation, then this doesn't occur, uh, important. But if we assume large curvature perturbation at small scale to produce produce PBH, inevitably the gravitational wave can be induced by this secondary effect. And the important point is this is, can be larger than the primordial uh, gravitational wave produced by inflation, although it's a secondary effect. The, the, so quite recently, the nanograv report is the detect, a hint of the detection of, hint of detection of gravitational wave at nano house. But the, if we assume the, to produce primordial black hole with the mass of one solar mass, then inevitably the secondary effect of gravitational wave can fit here. The automatically, and it also um, predicts the one solar mass of PBH with the order of say one percent or something. Then this one percent of PBH can also produce the, the major event of gravitational waves. So far, the Lig and the Bago couldn't observe this subdominant major event, but the, in future the like and bug and indigo and the Kagura collaboration, this sensitivity may observe this the uh, one solar mass PVH event, which can explain nanogram events. Okay. 
And uh, I, this time I'd like to express that, that if the transition from the matter domination to radiation domination is very fast, it's called sudden transition, not the exponential decay of scalar field. It's a much more sudden one, uh, say it's an instantaneous transition. Then th this time the gravitational potential, time derivative of gravitational potential is very huge. Then the, the this induced gravitation wave, secondary induced gravity can be, gravitation wave can be enhanced very much. So in future, we may observe this, this effect. Microarrayator Takahiro Terada named it the poltergeist mechanism, the poltergeist mechanism. Then if we observe this kind of enhancement of the secondary gravitation wave by the sudden transition from matter domination to radiation domination, say evaporation of PVHs or evaporation of cube balls, then the, it might be the result of this sudden transition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At last, I, I briefly mentioned the formation of the PVH in mat early matter domination. After inflation, we may expect the early matter dominated effect uh, epoch before the complete radiation domination, say before the MEV epoch. To, then the formation mechanism is completely different because the, uh, the pressure is negligible. So people may think that the PVH could be more produce, but, but the competing effect exists because the perturbation can evolve non-spherically. It cannot be closed by horizon. So there, there, are, there are two competing effects. And by considering the yeah, very yeah, precise calculation, or yeah, actually even in matter domination, PBH could be produced for smaller density perturbation. But yeah, this is a very important point. And due to the, the angular momentum effect, this could be suppressed. But the, uh, yeah, if density perturbation is smaller than order 0.1 or something, it, the size of the PBH was produced in the early matter domination. And simultaneously, it has a large the curvature, no, large angular momentum. So if we observe the large angular momentum of PBH, then it is a result of the formation in early matter dominated epoch. Okay, that's a, my message. Okay, I would like to conclude my talk. So actually, primary black hole can be produced both in early radiation and the early matter domination. And uh, yeah, live and bug event can be fit by black hole, prime black hole, and PBH can be dark matter if mass is 10 to 17 gram to 10 to 23 gram. And nanograb hints of gravitational wave can be fitted by this prime and black hole formation scenarios. And the one solar mass PBH is, is predicted to fit this one. And in future, by using DESIG or BBO or Cosmic Explorer, that we can discriminate the PBH event from the astrophysical binary black hole margins. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kaz. So, questions? Yes, in our, in our and Guillermo, you next, yes. Thank you very much for uh, uh, nice you. talk and the, the overview. Uh, I have a question about uncertainty of this uh, LIGA uh, bounds, because in principle, yes, yes. Uh, so you have this population of black holes, but then for them to start to merge, uh, there must mm -hmm. be some, some dynamical friction or whatever. And this, I guess, depends on Byron physics, on stars, matter, and so on. So how, how this would be accounted in the uncertainties? Uh, so it's completely different from astrophysical black holes the, the, because the main, no, no, the progenitor star may have a friction or something, right? But the, this is, this occurs in the radiation domination and the, the locally, locally, the gravity dominates the radiation pressure or something. So the, yeah, so yeah, it's not the cosmo, homogeneous effect. This is locally, you know, closed effect. So uh, 
few people have studied the friction is negligible. Uh, is it but, okay? But, but what I mean is that uh, today to have mergers, they have th these black holes have to come close to mm. each other. So there's some uh, history right. behind that. I mean, like. Right, right. But now, uh, yeah. But uh, you see, eccentricity disappeared. The, the the at the late epoch then so for the moment yeah i think that there and the uncertainty is not so big it's the same as the astrophysical black hole i see okay yeah thank you yeah thank you very much yes uh guillermo your hand is, uh, is up Go ahead. yes um thank you for the talk i have a question mm -hmm. about what you mentioned about um, inflation you had uh, two or three mm -hmm. slides about models yes i wanted to ask you yes yeah. uh, the next uh, and, and the one after you had the uh, two slides first you had a hilltop model right yeah yeah and one then there's, yes and then you gave another um, another slide after where you were discussing the running of the spectral index and the running ah, this of the one. run. Yeah, so here I wanted to ask you if there is any specific uh, Lagrangian behind this or if it is just a yeah, yeah. parametrization of the power spectrum. Yes, yeah, so this one, the, this one may, can give the large running and large running or running as an example. Uh -huh. and, and with this one, which is the which is the mass of the primordial black holes that you produce? Ah, okay, a good question. So, okay, it's easy to produce lighter PBH, so running with like the, right here. So to realize dark matter PBH, say 10 to 17 gram, it's very easy. The running is 0 0.01 and running or running is also 0 0.101, so produce, LIGO events, it's very difficult. The parameter it should be tuned very much. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a good point. I didn't say such a negative point. Yeah. Okay, but but with this one you can you can get the correct CMB. Uh, you fit yes, the CMB yeah. correctly, and yeah. uh, you get enough inflation and also all the dark matter okay. in primordial black holes. Okay, sorry. The in total the e following number should be sixty, right? So if right. this, yeah. But so only to produce the the LIGO event. So e following number is 17, 17. So it's very small. So <laughs> we need second inflation to realize sixty. So it, this is also a negative point. So we need there yeah, are two inflations, second two stage of inflations, and for two. Produce dark matter PBH, so it's a different. So we need here, here it produces the 17 gram PBH, so this is a different scenario. Yeah, so this model doesn't produce the dark matter prime in the black hole. Yeah, sorry, right. this is also right. a negative point. <laughs> yeah, you are right. right. So, so maybe in this sense, this uh, ultra slow roll uh, uh, models mm. that you were mentioning uh, have an advantage, right? Because they they can get mm. all the dark matter uh, and also have enough inflation. Whereas I think this this hilltop example that you that you showed, either you get uh, correctly the the CMB or uh, enough inflation, but you cannot get both at the same time, right? If Not if you so want correct. if you want uh, <laughs> if you want to get uh, dark matter as primordial black holes, that's my point. I mean, Not I, I so correct because. I think it's the same similar, even if you adapt the ultra slow roll inflation. The it's a you know, slope is very steep, right? 10 to uh, k to force. So it's easy to enhance. But the yes. situation is the same as this one. If it produces the dark matter here, then yes. it's okay. And if the, the energy scale is small, much smaller than gut scale, then e foreign number would be that 40. 43 or something, then it's consistent with each other. But uh, it's the same as this hilltop model, another learning model. Well, yeah, okay. Maybe we can discuss later, but my, my point is that I don't think with this hilltop model, you can uh, satisfy the following three things together. Having all the dark matter in primordial black holes, fit in the CMB and having enough inflation. That's, that's my point, okay? Yeah. Okay, but uh, well, ultra slow roll, then uh, running or running is small, right? 
ネグリジブ。Only spectral tilt、えー。Only by spectral tilt you are,、uh, uh, yeah, realizing this large curvature perturbation at small scale. So that's a different point. Yeah, okay. We, we can. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can yeah. discuss、okay. it maybe later because I think I, I'm going to mention some of yeah, this yeah. in, in、okay. my talk later.、So、I don't want to,、uh, okay. to hijack the discussion now.、Uh, I, okay. I wanted to mention that、uh, we a s k all the speakers of today's session to stay slightly on Zoom when we will finish this discussion in case people want to discuss something else and、uh, we can create breakout rooms for that.、Uh, Sebastian, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> your hand is up. Go ahead. Yeah.、Um, So,、uh, like, I'd like to ask a very, very general question about the first part of your talk, where you discuss the,、mm -hmm. um, how the curvature perturbations are related to the abundance of primordial black holes.、Oh, okay, right. It's、um, a simple, simple relation, not, not the exact, exact, exact one.、It's、yeah, so that, that's exactly the, the, the point of my question. So, how large is the uncertainty here? So, so I mean,、uh, of course. Very the, big.、Okay. Very big. Yeah, because、uh, simultaneously we discussed. The, the, the so called peak statistics, then the, this, this is completely different. This is like a spread s h i f t e the simplest case, simplest analysis. And by, by using peak statistics, namely, we, we additionally assume that second derivative of special derivative is negative or something to produce a peak. Then the yeah, estimate is completely different. And in that case, the, unfortunately, One of the magnitude can be modified. So, or same mass or same k. Yeah, you're right. This is, has a huge uncertainty. And unfortunately, are there models、uh, like procedures on the market to, to, to be more precise or like uh, or, or all approaches have this large uncertainty? My recommendation is to use the peak statistics, not this one. This is just a represent, yeah, just a yeah, yeah, presentation of the simplest model.、Yeah. If、okay. you adapt the peak statistics, then it's good. Okay, thank you. Okay,、um, any other questions to c a s I don't think so.、Um, well, thanks again for、yeah. the interesting talk. Thank you very much.、Um, so, thanks all three speakers for today's session. Yes, we can upload. So, people are welcome to stay in, in Zoom and have discussion. And if, if they want to have discussion with different speakers, we can br bring them into different rooms. So, Otherwise, we reconvene at t w o o'clock European time. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Oleg, thank you very much for sharing this session.、Uh, so, I have opened three breakout rooms.、Uh, I don't know if we need them or we can stay all here.、Uh, so,、uh, if, if we want, we can ask、uh, speakers to, to join、uh, corresponding breakout rooms. I, I don't know. Like, if. if、uh... Yeah, we, we are not so many. We are 27 now, so maybe we can live in this room. Are we no longer on、uh, YouTube?、Uh, we are on YouTube. Shall I, shall I turn this off? <laughs>、yeah.